is Rachel Mills for Birch Gold, and I am very pleased to be joined today by Jim Rogers, legendary investor. Thank you so much, Jim, for joining me. I am delighted to be here, Rachel. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about stock market highs and quantitative easing and inflation and a little bit of Federal Reserve and when is the taper going to happen and currency wars. But there is one question that I don't have to ask you, which you get asked a lot, I know, and that is what is your secret to being so prescient in the marketplace? As far as I know, I'm not quite sure. I do know that I have learned over the years that most of the time when people are, well, first of all, always when, when nearly everybody's thinking the same way, I mean, somebody's not thinking, I mean, we got to start thinking about it and see if there's not another way, to, another approach, because if everybody says the sky is blue, I at least urge you to go and look out the window and see if it's blue, because I have found that most people won't even bother to look out the window. If they see on the television or the newspaper or something that everybody says the sky is blue, uh, I at least urge you to look out the window. I find that most people don't want to do their homework. That's the first problem that many people have, is just doing simple homework. Uh, second, uh, I have learned that if everybody says this is blue, then, and I go and look out the window and see that it is blue, I have also learned that, well, wait a minute, if everybody knows the sky is blue, is that going to change? Uh, right. Now that everybody knows something, is it time to start thinking about, well, maybe tomorrow the sky will not be blue? Uh, mm -hmm. And again, most people say, well, everybody knows the sky is blue, and that's all we need to know. No, it's not all you need to know, because... One, another thing I have learned in my life is that no matter what we all think today, it's not going to be true in 10 or 15 years. Uh, Rachel, you pick any year in history uh, and go back and then look to see what, what everybody thought was true in that year. 15 years later, the world had changed enormously, enormously. And yet, in that particular year, everybody was convinced that this is the way the world was. And I picked 1900, 1930, 1950, any year you want to pick. Yeah. And you will see that 15 years later, the world was totally, totally different from what everybody thought it was at that time. So I have learned, for whatever reason, to know that change is coming, to know to think against the crowd, that the crowd is nearly always wrong, and to try to think for myself, and I've certainly made plenty of mistakes and have made plenty of mistakes in my life, uh, but these are some of the things that I have learned that think, try to think around the corner, try to think to the future if you want to be successful. Yeah, that's right, and, and I, I read somewhere, tell me if this is true, that you were shorting real estate in 2006? Yes, 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 we have 2006, yes, yes, I was short, Fannie Mae, I was short, uh, all, all the best banks, I was short, you know, all of that sort of stuff, the home builders back in those days. And I, I bet, see. Were, were people rolling their eyes at you? Were they laughing at you? Oh, very much, very, very, very much so. Uh, you know, I was on television quite a lot in those days, saying it's crazy. I was once on TV on, on uh, CNBC, mm -hmm. and... Uh, and lady, I lady said to me, and I explained to her, I say, oh, you and I, I was short Fannie Mae and have been short Fannie Mae. And Fannie Mae finally started to collapse. And the lady said to me, well, it's your fault that Fannie Mae is going down. It's the short sellers that are causing, causing problems with Fannie Mae. And I explained to her, listen, lady, if you really think that short sellers are making Fannie Mae collapse, you better get another job. Uh, because that's not the way the world works. No. Short sellers not make Fannie Mae go from 70 to zero, I assure you. The only thing that can make that happen is serious fundamental problems. So, yes, everybody was, knew I was nuts back in those days. And then they started blaming it on me, you know, the short sellers, all of the problems. You know, nobody likes to take responsibility for their mistakes, uh, certainly not politicians. Oh, that's, it was, that's true. It was clear that, that then they started, you know, first they laugh at you, then they uh, ridicule you and say, it's your fault, blame it on you. Eventually, they all say, oh, well, we knew that. We thought of it ourselves. We, we knew that it was a fraud. But that's, that's a difficult and sometimes painful process. 
Yeah, it sounds like they were a- attributing more power to you than you actually have. <laughs> that's, well, that's crazy. Delightful. It'd be wonderful if all I had to do was sell something short and it would go down. But unfortunately, it usually goes up when I sell it short. My timing is usually pretty wrong. I want to talk a little bit about currencies. It seems that all the major countries in the world are in this race to the bottom to devalue their currency relative to all the others to appease their export industry. Meanwhile, workers and savers are getting killed by the cost of living increases that this is causing. Do you have any observations or predictions about how this currency war is going to end, or can it continue somehow indefinitely? And who wins in a currency race to the bottom? Well, the first thing you need to know is that nobody ever wins a trade war. Uh, a currency war is just another kind of trade war. Um, everybody loses in the end. Some may temporarily come out ahead, but it's temporary and nothing else. So we all, as you pointed out, the cost of living for many people is going up, and it certainly is. My gosh, in Japan, you know, the currency is down 25% in a year. Well, I assure you, the Japanese are feeling that because everything that Japan imports has gone up fairly substantially, and and even the things that they don't import are up because the the, the Japanese manufacturers and the Japanese producers can raise prices because they don't have to worry about competing with the foreigners anymore. So we're all losing in currency wars. Uh, how long can it go on? Well, it can go, go on as long as politicians can continue to print money. The, the problem is, of course, eventually, eventually, the market will just say, we're not going to play this game anymore, mm-hmm. and we'll have a serious collapse. You, you, you and I can print money all day long, but at some point, you, I, and everybody else is going to say, well, wait a minute, guys, this money's getting worse, worse and worse, and more and more worthless, so why don't we stop? Why don't we stop playing this game? Um, I wish the politicians were smart enough to at some point say, we got to stop this, this is going to be bad. But unfortunately, they never have. Right. And probably, well, you, you know that Mr. Bernanke is certainly not going to stop it because he doesn't want to go down in history as causing the collapse. This is Yeltsin, when she comes, uh, Yellen, when she comes in. She's not going to stop it. First of all, she doesn't believe in stopping it. She thinks printing money is good. And she said, she knows, I hope she's smart enough to know that if she stops, oh my gosh, it's going to collapse. So she's not going to stop. Nobody wants to go down as, as causing the collapse of the, of the, of the world. And so I'm afraid this is going to go on until the market eventually says to them, okay, enough is enough. We have a big collapse. And then they're all thrown out, and we can start over. Wow. Yeah, that, that's, that's a painful scenario, actually. Um, do, do you think there's any chance that Larry Summers would have stopped quantitative easing at all? Well, first of all, that's irrelevant because yeah. he's not going to be Federal Reserve uh, chairman. Uh, second, even if he'd started, you know, somebody came in and said, okay, we've got a terrible problem, we've made horrible mistakes. Now, let's change things. And even if everybody in the world said, you know, he's right, we got to do something. And they started, well, within a few months or a year or two, the pain would be pretty horrible. And then everybody's going to say, well, we didn't know the pain was going to be this bad. This is not what we signed up for. And then the guy will either be thrown out or assassinated or who knows what. Oh, yeah. Uh, They they would blame everything on, on whoever stopped the party. Yeah, whoever they said is fine. At first they said it's fine, we want to do it. But once the pain comes, mm-hmm. they're not gonna, and the pain is pretty serious. We, we had Mr. Volker who came in and was told, you know, stop, stop the madness back in the 70s. And he did. Uh, well, Jimmy Carter got thrown out because he was, uh, who had told him to do that because the pain was so bad. Reagan, of course, thought it was wonderful that his pain was taking place because that got him elected. And it was help to clean up the problems, but that's what happens. You know, you cause the pain, and they throw you out. So you don't think there's any way they're going to make good on their threats or promises to taper? Uh, they might. Uh, no, no. A, I don't. Uh, they, they might start, as I said, but somewhere they would along stop. the. Yeah. 
along the line, they're going to start doing it. But then when the pain gets pretty serious, uh, the, the lady or the person, whoever, whoever it is, is going to have real problems. Uh, I mean, let's say that in 2015, Yellen says, we got to stop this. And they start stopping it. Well, that point is going to be uh, pretty serious for the parties in power, and they're going to get thrown. And the next guys will continue to the taper because, as I said, they got power because of the tapering and the problems, and it will clean up the problems. But that's the only way that you're going to see it stop someday. But the market's just going to say, we don't want to keep playing. That's what happened with uh, right. Jimmy Carter. Right. And he was in, he was in the market, was just, everything was collapsing. Bond yields were falling apart. Uh, inflation was everywhere. Thank you, Mr. Carter. We don't want to play this game anymore. It's absurd. What so tip-offs I, the, are you looking for for the where the top of the market is and, and when you would start to see the collapse coming? Are, are there signs that you're looking for? Well, uh, back I wish I was that smart. It was that <laughs> easy. Back in the late 70s, there was Mr. Uh, Volcker was told, and he came in and said, I am going to kill inflation because Mr. Carter has told me to. And Mr. Carter was very clear that he had to stop inflation. Now, I doubt if we'll have that kind of uh, scenario again, but we would think, we would hope that the Federal Reserve will announce, uh, We, are, you know, they publish their numbers so we can all see what's happening at the moment, they're buying a trillion dollars a year. That's a trillion with a T yeah. of bar of assets. Uh, eventually, we will see that they've stopped that if they do or slow it down. What will probably happen is they will slow it down at first to see what happens. And if it, if things aren't too bad at first, and they probably won't be too bad at first, well, what is likely to happen is they will slow it down, things will drop, and then they will rally, and then the Federal Reserve will say, hey, this is not so bad. We can do it. And they'll cut some more, and things will drop again, and then rally, because uh, it'll take a while for people to really believe how bad it can get, or will get. And so you will have, uh, eventually, you will have, they will try to cut, it will cause the, finally cause the collapse, and at that point we'll have a big change, because they'll throw them out, whether it's the politicians or the uh, central bankers or whoever. Guys will continue because they like it, they got the job because of the collapse, and then we'll finally start over, but it may be really painful in the meantime. Sure, and and when we do begin the process of starting over, whenever that happens, it will be really good to have something substantial, something real, something other than paper in your portfolio, and that's what Birch Gold is trying to help people figure out how to do. So we've always said that precious metals are a type of insurance for the long term, I read in your interview in Barron's that you are holding gold right now and expecting maybe a buying opportunity to come up. Do you still feel that way? Yes, I I own gold for many years. I've never sold any gold. Uh, And I I can't imagine I ever will sell gold in my life because it is somewhat of an insurance policy. I, I hope that my daughters own my gold someday. I mean... I own gold. I've never sold any gold. And if it goes down, and I expect it, I expect it to go down. Uh, it doesn't mean it will. And if it goes down, I'll buy more. But I'm certainly not going to sell. Right. Um, so what advice would you give someone who, as of yet, has no precious metals in their portfolio right now? Well, everybody should own some uh, precious metals as an insurance policy. So if they don't have any right now, I would urge them to go. Buy something, buy yourself a, a gold coin, if nothing else, and see that it's not going to hurt. It won't hurt you when you buy your first gold coin, your first silver coin. And from that, you start accumulating uh, as your own situation uh, dictates. First, do your homework. Go buy gold because you heard me say it, or even because you heard you say it, you, Rachel, say it. You know, But uh, if people don't own them, they should start after they've done their homework. And then they will probably, if they do their homework, most people will then realize, oh, my gosh, I better have insurance. And gold and silver will may get me through serious problems ahead. Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about silver? Do you favor silver over gold, or how, how do you feel? Well, silver is historically is down 60% from its all-time highs. So, yes, I would prefer silver at the moment because gold is down only, what, 
30 or 40 percent of its all-time highs. Well, thank you so much for, for talking with me today. I think we will leave it there. Thank you so much, Jim Rogers. Thank you, Rachel. Anytime. Let's do it again. I would love to. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.